record. Okay, nice. We should be up and running. So uh, if you don't see the screen, please type it in the chat. Um, other than that, I'm going to assume that we are ready to go. Um, yes, everything should be ready now. All right. Um, yeah, so today is going to be a bit of a network introduction. Um, it's, uh, turned out that this lecture was a good one to fit that in a little bit since we didn't get to do it in cloud last year. So we can do a little bit now. Uh, and um, if you've done networking before, then it's going to be maybe a little bit of a repetition, but um, hopefully it won't be completely wasted. And then afterwards, we will look at doing HTTP requests in Android. We will be like uh, looking at some of the options you have, and uh, we're going to have an example using Retrofit, um, which where we will interact with a REST API to get some data into uh, through, through a JSON format and then parse it into objects in Android and display them in a list. So, and that's going to be using, uh, we're going to use both coroutines and live data as part of doing that, which will sort of help tie this into what you learned the previous weeks. And it will be a little bit of repetition on how to do some of those tasks with the, uh, by using those libraries as well. So that's going to be cool. And we're also going to uh, look at what other alternatives to retrofit that you have. And uh, what's probably the most interesting to many of you as it will uh, show you why what you did in cloud was important if you had cloud. If you're an international student, if you um, programmed anything, uh, any backend services, web servers, databases before, then this will still be applied to you, uh, except it won't maybe hit this close to home as the people who have already taken the cloud course. So we will be using the backends we wrote in Go uh, and sort of read the parse the data from there and show it in Android so that you can see sort of the connection between writing the backend and then consuming the backend uh, on a mobile device and show that as a front end. So and that will sort of uh, tie into thin versus thick clients and servers as well. So we'll be able to look a little bit into uh, those ex kind of things in practice as well. But let's just start with uh, the networking primer. Um, I have the chat open now, so questions are, well, it closes when I change slides, but I will check it regularly. So let's uh, start with the very extreme basics, um, and then we'll take it from there. So uh, networking, in a way, can be thought of as a way to communicate. Uh, and what you communicate between uh, that's really up to you. There's there are many different choices. For example, if you you can communicate between the same software. So for example, if you write uh, your own, say if you write your mobile application, uh, you can use networking to use that, to have that application communicate with itself. For example, between different threads. So if you have two threads that need to communicate, you can use networking to communicate between them, but it's not necessarily the best tool for the job. Uh, for example, you can also use shared data structures or uh, mutexes to lock the data and then sort of put data between those two. Uh, you can have some sort of a consumer and producer pattern that you've looked at in operating systems, uh, but you can also use networking and open like a port uh, in each of the threads and sort of send data between them, which is the way to communicate within the same software. Um, you can have different software on the same machine. For example, if you're familiar with Linux, uh, it had the display server is called an X server and all of the GUI and applications interact with that software. And it's basically a networked interface in a way. Uh, or you can have, uh, uh, if you have, basically you can have two different pieces of software. Let's say write a script to work against an API of a software that you have on your computer and then you can sort of and the software is scriptable as well. You can create sort of open network connections on both of those programs and communicate. Like the details aren't so important, but the point is that you can uh, communicate between different software as well. Or if you can do it, you can also do it between different software and different machines. So this is when networking starts becoming to become more interesting because now you're not communicating only on your own machine, which you can do with other means, 
as well. Like for example, just saving a file and then reading it from another program. Um, and that's more when you get like, for example, you use Firefox on your computer and there's a web server on some different computer and Firefox sends a request and you get the response back. So that's more, that's more the traditional way you think about networking. I'm sure if you think about networking, you mostly think about having two different machines communicate. But it's not, not restricted to that. I just wanted to highlight that networking also can be used within the same machine. Uh, you have also the same software and different machines. So for example, if you play a game and another person plays a game, uh, those games might be talking directly together if it's, uh, unless they use a dedicated server to host in which case it goes through a server and then back to the game. But in a way you can think about when you play the, a game against someone else, uh, usually you are the, it, it's sort of the same software because you are playing the same game mode so that all of the data is transferred and you need to, and you know everything up front. And that software is designed to interact with itself across the internet. So you have a diff few different ways to communicate. But the, essentially networking lets you communicate between different machines. And there's more to it, of course. Uh, how do you get to the correct machine? How do you get to the correct place? Uh, how do you ensure the data is you know, consistent in order? And that's all of the details that sort of comes on top of it. But at the basic level, it's basically a way to communicate between uh, two pieces of software, the same software, the same machine, different machines in locally or worldwide. Uh, and to communicate, you use basically sockets is what is used to communicate. That's uh, the very lowest level. There is a socket at some point. Uh, but in most cases, you generally don't work with those guys directly, but rather through some higher level of abstraction. So that might be a library, um, or it's, maybe it's built into the language in a way. Um, for example, in, in uh, in Go, it, creating a web server was basically as easy as just creating a function that returned a response and then sort of go handle everything else. But at the very basic level, even in Go, there's probably a socket at the very bottom of that. But you don't never interacted with the socket directly. You just interacted with like an HTTP server and you gave it some responses and some URLs that it could handle. And then that guy, that class sort of handled everything for you. Um, you have two different kind of sockets. There are more, but so we will not discuss them. And those are TCP sockets uh, or UDP sockets. They're not called spray and pray sockets, but uh, you can think about them in, in that way because they're less reliable and they, you just sort of send things and hope that it gets there. Uh, so let's start with TCP. Uh, it stands for Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, and it's uh, defined in an RFC. If you remember from cloud, that's a request for comments. And that's sort of where it's specified. So if you want to really study it, you can read the RFC for it. Um, anyway, uh, if you send, say you have two uh, sockets or like just let's think about them as computers. And one of them is connected to the others and you send hey ho and tra la 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 la. If you send this on a TCP protocol, then the receiver is guaranteed to get it in the same order and the data is guaranteed to be correct. Um, so there's basically no way this data is not going to get there. Uh, and it also has the concept of a connection. So before you can send anything, you need to make sure that connect to the other end. So if two computers want to talk with TCP, they have to first connect together and then uh, the one who's being connected to has to accept the connection. And once everybody's sort of in there, then they can start sending data. So the benefit is clearly that once you've established a connection, you can send data and it will arrive in order and it will be correct every time. Um, for example, HTTP uses it because if you say, if you uh, connect it to a website and then you got some data back and the HTTP or the HTML is completely messed up because you didn't get things in the correct order, the data is wrong, uh, it would be kind of a pain to uh, interact with websites. Um, so if it's very important that data remains intact and in order, uh, it's, a, it's a good protocol. And also the concept of a connection, of course. Uh, on the other hand, um, UDP 
uh, it called, stands for user datagram protocol. Uh, if you send hey on ho and tralala here, uh, there's a chance it's not gonna get there. Uh, or when it arrives, they might also arrive out of order. So you can get tralala and hey ho, or you can just get just hey ho, or just tralala, or none of them. So there's no guarantee. Uh, but if you do get it, the data is still going to be hey ho and tralala. So if you actually end up getting it, it's going to be uncorrupted data. So in theory, you could still use, in a way, a write send an HTML document with UDP as well. Uh, but then you would manually have to manage and ensure that you sort of shuffle the data back in order. So uh, what you would also send with the data, then you can't really just send hey ho and cha la la. You might want to send timestamps as well. That way, the receiving end can mix and match the uh, the data back in the correct order, even though they don't get them in the wrong order. And you can also send, for example, up front, how many packets am I going to send? But then you sort of start building a protocol on top of UDP. So you can sort of build TCP on top of UDP uh, in a way by make by starting to send this extra data to verify the data you get. So. Uh, anyway, UDP does not maintain an open connection. You just send to an IP and hope it gets there. That's why I call it spray and pray in a way, because they cannot arrive. They might arrive in the, out of order. You just sort of throw the data out there and hope that it gets there, uh, which is really nice for performance because there is no checks, there is no connections, there is no overhead almost. So you can just send data and it's going to be really, really, really fast. So for example, when you don't, it doesn't matter to lose some data. Uh, games, for example, video conferences like Zoom, like we're doing now, uh, they're probably uh, using UDP because if you lose one frame of the video, you, you won't notice, right? So it's, it's okay to lose the frame every now and then. Uh, it's, uh, of course, when you're watching Netflix, for example, it's a bit annoying to lose frames because the speeds might start lagging, but uh, it's not the end of the world in a way. And likewise, when you're playing games, games go at, at least 60 frames per second. So if you send 60 packets per second, you don't really have to care if 30 of them or five of them get lost because it's so many and so many updates that um, losing one or two might not matter so much. So then it's get better to have the speed to just get the packet out there rather than the reliability. So. That's in a, a, a huge way the, the largest reason to use it. And of course, you can build your own protocols on top of it. Uh, that's a bit more advanced, so let's not look at that. But the, the core things that you should remember from this is that TCP has a connection and it's reliable, so you'll get it in order and with the correct data. Whereas UDP is really fast, connectionless, and data is not guaranteed to arrive or arrive in order. Those are like the key points to just know about them. Um, then you have something called the internet protocol, which is uh, what is used for uh, routing, which means make sure the packet or the data you're sending gets to the right place. So while UDP and TCP is more about uh, data integrity or the lack of it, uh, then internet protocol is about where do you send the data. So, so you have IP addresses, internet protocol addresses, uh, there are currently two standards, IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, this is an IPv4 address. Uh, it's denoted it has three dots in between, and each number between the dot is basically one byte of data. So it goes from 0 to 255. And 127001 is always your machine locally. So that's reserved for your machine. On IPv6, your machine locally is 0001. Uh, and uh, you have 128 bit addresses. So basically you have two bytes per colon, and then you have another two, another two, another two, another two, another two. And these are denoted with hex. And if you want to type an IPv4 address with IPv6, you go colon, colon, FFFF, colon, and then you can type an IPv4 address. So that's sort of like a backwards, uh, backwards compatible mode for it. Um, and the reason we needed to upgrade and get a way bigger address space is because in the modern time, uh, there's a lot of smartphones, a lot of devices, everything's basically connected to the internet. 
and a 32 bit address like this guy uh, can only hold about 4 billion values and with 7 billion people there is not going to be enough for everyone so and especially if people have multiple devices and there are always businesses corporations you know it's going to run out and a lot of them are reserved from the creation of it as well so uh, with this guy uh, it's going to be a while until we're going to run out because it holds 79 uh, yeah, what is this number even it's like 79 billion trillion no it's it's 79 million billion trillion times as many addresses as in ipv4 so you have and that's as how and that's this many times more than 4 billion so um it's going to be a while until we run out um so um in this case um this is what you use often to route it. So that's why you'll oftentimes see TCP slash IP because you use TCP as a connection and you IP for routing. Um, next, we'll look briefly at a subnet. And a subnet is a way to decide which part of an IP belongs to the network you're connected to. For example, your home network or your work network and which belongs to the host. So a host is a device like your phone or your laptop. Um, you oftentimes see it written with a, a slash after the IP, for example, 192.168.01 slash 24, or with IPv6, it's, you could see it like yeah, FF31, 18BD, 4312, 2020.9DB9 slash 64 using, uh, and this, number afterwards says how many bits are going to be used uh, for the network and how many are used for the hosts. So with 24, uh, that means uh, 24 is three bytes or 24 bits. And each one of these numbers is a byte. So with three of them, that means the first three numbers are used for your uh, network. And the last one is used for your host, which is the device. That means this part of the address is going to be the same for all devices on this network. And only this number is going to change for every device. So if you have a mobile and a PC and a tablet or something on your network, uh, then this number is going to be unique for each one of those. Um, now, if you have 24 on the network here, that means you only have room for 255 devices. So if you have more than 255 phones at your home, uh, you will run out of addresses locally. So, and if you, here, however, you can, with 64 bits as a net mask, then you have 64 bits remaining as well, uh, which means you'll have uh, uh, a lot more than 4 billion, four times as many, no, 16 times as many um, addresses available for devices. So clearly there's a lot more wiggle room uh, for IPv6 addresses. Um, originally this number could only be slash eight, slash 16 or slash 24, um, but refer also to class A, B and C networks. Uh, because if you have a class A, then only the first number is used for the network and the rest is for devices, which means you can have a lot of devices on this network. With 16, then the two first bytes are your network and the two remaining is for uh, devices, which means you can still have a lot, but not quite as many as here. Uh, you can have 65,000 units here. And 24 is the lowest one, where you just have one byte less for the devices. Um, and however, this was changed. Now you can use an arbitrary number, number as long as it is x number of ones followed by zeros. And for IPv4, that means you have up to 32 ones and uh, then uh, the remaining number of zeros until you get to 32. So you can use a net mask of slash one now, which means you can only have one device on the, that net work, which means you basically just have the router. So that makes no sense, but you can do it as long as it's a pattern of just ones and then zeros. Um, because if we did also, if we didn't have this feature, then we would probably have run out of IP addresses a long, long time ago. ago. Since, uh, for example, on my computer, uh, I will have some IP address. 
which is local to my network and the router in the house is the one that sort of gets the uh, IP from the whole internet. So that means my how the this house only has one IP shared to the world, but within this house we have a subnet uh, where, which the router decides, and I can have you know my uh, n my own number of devices in here because if every house and every computer in every house would have its own IP address uniquely to the world, um, then we would have run out a long time ago because you know we are seven billion people and companies of course have a lot of computers. So now a company building might just have uh, one way out to the real internet and then that's just like one IP for them. So subnets really help in terms of uh, allowing us to not run out as fast. But And this is also uh, part of the reason a, an IP address cannot necessarily uniquely identify a person because if you have four people in the home and four people sharing that IP then it could be any of those. Yeah. Um, second, we have the concepts of ports. So if IP addresses are, are airports, then ports are like the gates where people go off and on the plane, except the people are packets and uh, you refer to them as ports instead of gates. Uh, and this allows you to have multiple connection per computer because if you just could refer you to your computer by an IP address, then you could only have, sort of only have one connection at a time. Uh, and port 0 to 1023, they are reserved. Uh, and you can have up to 65,537 ports, which is like 2 to the power of 16 number of ports. So everything above this you can use. So in cloud, we used 8080 a lot. That was a popular one because 80 is the one for HTTP. So if you just slam another 80 on there, you sort of have HTTP, your own HTTP. And you cannot use ports. You can, you can use your ports freely. Uh, as long as they're not already in use by somewhere else. Um, so that's a way to sort of subdivide the IP so the data goes to the right application on your computer. And think about it like airport and gates is a nice way because then when you send data or yourself from Oslo to Berlin, for example, then you are you are at one IP address, which is one airport, and you send yourself to another one and you step in on gate E25 and you come out at gate whatever 26 or something. So you sort of go from an airport and a gate to another airport and a gate and the airports are uh, the computers in a way. So that's a way to think about it, to reason about it. So that's the really fast um, primer. So uh, I am do you have a quiz as well? So we can going to try to run that now. Um, so that's related to this stuff. So if you see the number up here, please go to menti.com and use this code and we will have a quick recap through a quiz where the prize is a secret koala photograph. So if you win, I will send it to you on Discord. I think you should be able to join now. Yes, there's some hearts. Let's see how many people we are so we know for how long to wait. We are 10 right now. Um, so Marius, if you do join, I expect you to win. Uh, and if you don't, then your students can feel very proud of themselves. So we are nine out of 10. That's probably good enough. I will wait a couple more seconds. Okay, so uh, let's start. I hope everybody's ready because the prize is a photograph. Okay, so let's go to the first one.
what does TCP stand for? So alternatives should be on your phone or your computer. Nice, good job. So I am, I'm a bit sad that there's no way to transfer cats over the internet, but um, I guess that's gotta be another RFC. So you won't see the points until after the fourth question. So which of the following protocols are reliable? Nice. So uh, TCP nine to one, that is a very overwhelming response. And it's uh, of course TCP that is the reliable one. So we are two questions in, what are the advantages of UDP sockets? So as we just saw, those are, well, I won't spoil you. Speed nine and one did not answer, but uh, flexibility is also correct in a way because you can build so much on top of UDP because it's very, uh, it doesn't restrict you very much. So you can build, as I mentioned, you can build TCP on top of it. Uh, FTP, I think is built on top of UDP, at least uh, the light version TFTP. Um, so yeah. Now, so far, let's look at the leaderboard. So we have um, we have Visar at the top with 2,822. Then we have Bill and uh, Tweedo. Those are the, currently the best players here. I have no idea who you guys are, um, except Visar. Um, but I guess you're confident to use your real name because you know you'll you'll win this thing. So. Uh, okay, let's uh, look at given the subnet two five 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 five. Zero, what class network is that? That's a bit more um, uh, diverse, I would say. Um, so this would be uh, one of the addresses with a slash 24 after it. And the reason for that is that uh, all of these bits are sets, and this is 255, and this is 255, which means all of these bytes are completely filled. Uh, if only this one was 255, and then the, so if it was 255, 000, zero, zero uh, then you would have a class A because then only eight bits uh, were used for the network mask. So uh, I guess that's important to clarify that the 255 bits indicate the network, and the zero or the uh, the zero bits, so I guess it's harder to see it when it's say, um, when it's in numbers and not in bits, but um, the last number, or in this case, the number that's not filled up with ones is the one that's reserved for hosts uh, or devices. So if only the two first were 255, then it would be B. Uh, D, E, and F does not uh, exist. I just put that in there to be confusing. Uh, but I'll, I'll show an example with this afterwards with uh, just the bit numbers uh, to make it a little bit more clear. So let's go to the next one. Uh, what is the loopback address in IPv6? So, so I did show you this. Uh, let's see if you can figure it out. So uh, if you have a set number of zero bits in IPv6, you can just compress them with colons and you don't have to type them all out because it's 128 of them. So it's nice to save the space. Uh, this one's actually, should actually just be one colon in between. I, I accidentally put two in there. Well, actually, no, that's still correct because there could be any number of zero bits between there and between here. So they are both in fact valid. And one to seven is the loopback address for IPv4. But yeah, both of these or any arbitrary number of zeros up until 
you get 128 bits is correct. So let's look if you're still in the lead. Oh, we've had a change of leadership now. Now we have Mr. MN, the top hat, in the lead. And then we have Ronald, who's the fastest guy, and Ambriel as uh, an angel with 3,500 points. Okay, we have a couple of more questions left, so there's still room for improvement. So in Android, should you make network requests on the main thread? I did not go through Android yet, so let's go back. <laughs> let's, uh, let's look at the Android stuff. And then we will jump right back into the quiz. Okay, so let's look at the HTTP requests in Android real quick. Um, it's a bit more brief since we will be doing uh, an example afterwards. But there are a couple of libraries you can use. Uh, one of them is Volley, which is developed by Google. And then you have Retrofit and H OK HTTP, which are both de developed by some uh, company called Square. Uh, Retrofit actually builds on top of OK HTTP, so it uses it under the hood. And you can also use raw sockets through uh, Java's uh, socket library. Uh, not recommended unless you feel like you want to do it hard for. Um, so Volley lets you send raw HTTP requests. It's for HTTP requests specifically in a fast and efficient manner uh, where you basically set up request queues uh, and it will sort of handle those requests efficiently. Uh, so if you send a request or you send three requests in a queue, it's going to be able to uh, manage uh, when each re request is processed and if it has to wait for something it can start doing something else uh, and for example if you send a string request uh, this is how you would make one you would say create a string request with method get to a url and then you have a listener for what happens if you succeed and if you fail and uh, this you will get a response where you can set the text views text or something and the uh, the callbacks happen on the main thread, where of course the networking request does not happen on the main thread, because if you do so, uh, your application will crash with a, a network on main thread exception. So you should not send network requests on the main thread in Android, uh, because you will crash your application. Uh, yes, these slides are a little bit incomplete, so I'll cover it more in the example. Um, uh, in some ways, the way you use Retrofit, though, it will be familiar if you use Room. So um, I'll explain that when I go through the example. But uh, uh, a lot of the code you write for it will be familiar if you use Room because it still it declares you declare HTTP interfaces with annotations, like you would do in Room. So yeah, um, that's basically the short version. The rest of it comes in the in the example, so yeah, there's the bit mask. So, so uh, and then you'll see all the zero bits are bits that are left for uh, your host. So if you look at the chat, the Zoom chat, um, you will see that uh, the uh, subnet mask that we just looked at uh, belongs of these bits, which means uh, the remaining eight bits at the end there can be used for uh, host for devices uh, and then you so for example you could also have oh, sorry that was the same thing you could also have this as a net mask which would then be uh, which would then leave you with four the four bottommost uh, bits as a net mask which means you can now have 16 devices on this one uh, and the reason it's easier to see this as bits is, of course, if not, if we didn't show it as bits, then the last number here would be two for five, two for five, two by five, and then uh, let's see what this is: uh, one twenty-eight plus sixty-four plus thirty-two plus sixteen would be two forty. Uh, and that's then it's not as clear anymore, like how many bits are left. Um, so, but you have four bits left, which gives you two to the power of four uh, different hosts that you can use. So, as long as you have a x number of ones followed by zeros, remember that the zeros are 
the ones are what you count in the slash. And then the remaining bits is what you can use for hosts. So slash 16 means basically that there are 16 ones. And slash 8 means that there are 8 ones at the beginning. And 24 slash 24 means that there are 24 ones. So that's uh, with 24, you have a class C network, basically. So that, that slash is sort of the number of ones in the net mask. And uh, the zeros then are remaining for devices. So now we can progress with the question. Uh, in Android, should you make network requests in the main thread? Actually, only two people got to answer that. That's a bit of a shame. Um, unless I can redo the questions. Uh, no. OK, well, sorry about that. Uh, those guys who answered no. Um, you know, uh, you got some points. Um, next question is, which is not true about this address? 192.256.054 colon 68,000. Oh, is everybody out of here? No, they're still here. Might not be enough time. Can I extend this? Oh, no. Well, I guess it's a bit short. So what is not true about this? Um, that the address is valid is the only thing that's not true about it. So the port number is too high because the max one is 65,000 something, two to the power of 16. Uh, the address is invalid. Uh, yes, it is. So that's true about it. And the address is an IPv4 address. Um, that is also true. So it's not, not true. Um, and also this is 256 and the highest number is 255. I guess it's a bit of a mind fuck in terms of that it's not true. But I do admit that there was not quite enough time for this slide. So. And I guess you are the ones who were quick enough on the Android question. And finally we have MN, I don't know who you are, so I'm not unable to send you the price. If you type in the Zoom chat, however, uh, that's uh, I will send you the secret koala photograph. So uh, I hope that was a helpful uh, recap. Uh, and that it helped you, helped us reinforce some of the things that might not have been so clear during the presentation. So now we are going to do the live example, but maybe you guys want a little bit of a break first. We can do a five minute break before we continue. Uh, and then we will uh, look at how we could interact with the uh, HTTP API, the one we wrote in cloud last year. We're going to interact with... Oh, MN is, uh, is, uh, is uh, Marius. Okay, so the winner is Taylor Swift then. Uh, uh, that makes sense actually. So um, uh, good job on winning. Uh, and then uh, Taylor Swift can probably pronounce and uh, declare themselves the winner in the chat, and I will send a secret koala photograph later. Um, and yes, and then we will look at uh, using retrofit with uh, Android, and we'll, we will use also live data and coroutines to implement it. So that's going to be a good refresher. But uh, it's three o'clock now, so I will see you back at 3.05. So, uh, um, so I will, uh, we will continue then.
Okay, um, let's get back to it. So now we are going to look at how to use uh, uh, retrofit to do HTTP requests and parse the JSON we get back into some real objects. And we're going to display it on the screen in Android. Uh, and then hopefully throughout that process, you are going to be able to understand uh, how one way to interact with uh, interact with REST APIs or other HTTP APIs uh, using a library. Uh, you can use other libraries. Yeah, you can do it manually from scratch. Uh, but a good reason we are using uh, Retrofit today is because it ties in very nicely with uh, live data, coroutines. Uh, we're also going to use data bindings for it. Uh, so it ties in really nicely with what we've been discussing previous weeks. So it's going to be a nice refresher on how to use those things if you haven't uh, used them a lot already in your project. Uh, and also, um, it's uh, got a very intuitive way of working with it. So now that we discussed sort of the theoretical part, a uh, the little bit of the background, uh, we are going to be able to look at a little bit more higher level practically. So we won't actually touch on sockets uh, directly, but um, uh, now at least you understand a little bit more what's going on under the hood. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do uh, is just go into, into Go and just start up the server. So that's uh, our the API from our Go assignment last year. It's the first assignment with the countries and species. So that's the one we're going to be interacting with. I'm just going to move it away. And then if we open Firefox and go to our own site. So this is what we have. We have basically, it's uh, the country endpoint. So if you, you should all be familiar with this, if you're an exchange student, I will briefly go through it. Uh, so, uh, we have basically a list of countries with codes, country names, a country flag, and then a list of species that, uh, if I remember correctly, they are supposed to be extinct in that particular country. So in this case, we have uh, one country slash all, we have about 250 countries. So, and you can also look them up individually with like, for example, NO, and we're going to look at how to uh, do this as well. But this is the data that we are uh, going to be working with. Uh, let's also look at, uh, let's go to Retrofit and just go to their website. And you will see that it describes itself as a type safe HTTP client for Android and Java. Uh, it works with Kotlin as well. Uh, Java and Kotlin are interoperable, interoperable, uh, yeah, that word. Uh, so, and uh, there's a bit of an introduction here and in the download section. But we will go to their GitHub page to figure out what we need to include in our Gradle file to use it. Uh, and um, should be this guy right here. So if we go into Android Studio. So by the way, let's look at what we have up front, by the way. So you'll be familiar with it. Um, yeah, it's it just keeps building on this old app. So we basically have everything we've gone through in the past few weeks. So now there's a new men menu entry here called HTTP. If you click at that, we will get retrofit requests, and this is where we're going to be working today. So in addition to what we have from before, um, there's a new fragment called request fragment. Uh, it has nothing except a view model and also a view binding for its uh, layout file. Um, also, we have a new view model uh, to, attach, to attach itself to this, the request view model. It's completely empty, but we're going to fill it out. Um, and then we have the request, uh, the design for it, uh, which just holds a single recycler view. Uh, and the recycler view holds uh, an entry, and that's basically holding, uh, as we saw here, uh, oh, where did it go? There. So we're going to have the country name here, we're going to have the country code, and then we're going to have the number of extinct species on the right there. So that's that's the data we hope to be able to extract from this API uh, and show it in a mobile application. So that's where we are starting out. So now let's go to build.gradle and add, well, we already added them here, but 
you will need these two lines to use uh, retrofit the way we're going to do it today. So retrofit is the it is the library itself. 2.8.1 is the latest version as of today. And then there's also the JSON converter. Uh, JSON is the Java JSON library. And on what this converter does, it also comes uh, with, from Square. Uh, it allows us to automatically parse JSON into uh, into objects. Uh, so, uh, and that's uh, uh, the framework for what we are going to implement. So. so let's start to look at what we get back from the API. That would be the first step when we're using Retrofit. If this is the cloud API or some other API, it doesn't matter. Uh, but we want to look at the JSON that we're getting back. And what we can see is that this is an array because it has X number of elements. It's not wrapped in any kind of object. So the root element is an array. And each element of the array holds a code, country name, country flag, species, and species key. Um, which means um, it's a, going to be a bit like how you would do it in Go in this case. Uh, we need a struct or a data class that can hold these uh, variables. So we are going to be able to interface with this API. So to just do that, I'm going to go into the data folder and we're going to create a new Kotlin file. And I'm gonna call it uh, country, it makes sense. And we're going to create a data class that's gonna be called country. And in here, we're going to put the data. So uh, this is the data we need. And uh, I wish it was, uh, I could almost say that this was harder, but it's, uh, uh, it really not you basically you just have to specify it so this is the code and it's a string so this variable name um, should match with the json name uh, if not you'll have to um, override it uh, what's the stuff that, uh, uh, i'll show you afterwards but let's uh, let's assume for now that we're going to use the same names as in it's in here so you use a val country name, I'm going to assume as well, just to make sure everybody sees it. That's also a string, and country flag is a string. Uh, and the next one is a species, and that's an array of strings. So we're going to use that. Count, uh, what was that called? It was called species. It's a list of strings. And finally, we have species key, which is a list of int. So we're going to create our species key, which is a list of int. So this is the data class we are going to use uh, with retrofit, uh, as this is matches the format we're getting back from, from uh, the API. So if there was some other API, maybe you're interacting with uh, Reddit or uh, GitLab or something else maybe some corona source or uh, well it doesn't matter if there's an api that returns json data if you're able to match the data structure here uh, then you will be able to parse it so if this for example did not return an array but an object instead uh, an ob object with an array of countries for example so then we would have to create another one which is for example country response we can call it what we want but and this might hold a list of countries. So then we would have countries be a list of country. And then maybe it has a Boolean whether you're authenticated or not. And if this was the JSON return, then you can sort of, you have to build up the same data format as the JSON basically. So if it's a list of countries and an authentication Boolean inside of this JSON object, then you sort of have to build this on top, layer this on top of your original data class. But in our case, we just have an array so we, uh, of this object. So we don't actually have to specify any more than that this is the data. And whether or not this is an array, that comes later. But uh, now we have uh, our data class. Um, I didn't try it without all the fields. So yeah, there's a question, do you need a full structure to be able to auto-convert it? Um, I don't think you need that. Uh, we will, uh, we can try it afterwards. I didn't actually try that up front, but uh, I will I will try it. Uh, dynamic keys, uh, I guess, um, do you mean if this, 
the key, this key can be something else, or if it can be like this can be species in one case or dogs in another case. Um, in that case, I think assuming the first question works, then if you have, it can either be species and then it can be dogs or it can be cats. I would probably just put dogs. I would probably put them all in there and just see which, and then check, hey, is this one null? Is this one null? So maybe you put question marks there instead. And then you can say, hey, is this one filled? Is this one filled? And maybe just check which one is filled. That might be one way of doing it. But that assumes that you're allowed to put fields not in the JSON there. And I think you're allowed to do that. So uh, I will answer that at the same time as I answer the other questions when we try out to just remove some fields that we don't need. But uh, I think that should be possible if you just have uh, all the superficial fields in here as well. Um, right, so it would not be country name, Norway, not USA, but it would actually be. So that's more like that's like a JSON. Uh, map, I guess, where it's a key value pair. Let's get back to that after actually we've uh, tried this out. Um, and then maybe have an example of, uh, uh, maybe have a, an example of, um, of the JSON response itself. If you find, can find that, find that, maybe you can post it and we can look at the two different JSONs and see how we could create a, a data class for it. Anyway, so uh, uh, for now, let's uh, keep going and we can get back to it. So now that we have the data, um, so that's the data that this, uh, this uh, endpoint returns. Uh, however, um, we need a way to interact with the endpoint as well. And we need to connect the endpoint to the data it returns. Mm. So to do that, uh, we need to clear, create our new file and we will call it, uh, let's call it country. Um, yeah, for now, let's just call it country endpoint. And this is where retrofit starts looking a bit like room because if you consider the, yes, like what Mario says, it's also definitely valid. So, uh, because what this library does is it tries to convert a data structure into, into a type. But if you work with just JSON, JSON uh, the JSON library directly, for example, then you can just access uh, anything in the JSON and just look up, is this field there, is this field there? We can iterate all the fields and look at uh, look at their values and see what you have. So, and then you're doing it manually though, but uh, not with uh, with a type safe container like this one, which expects a certain format. So that's definitely an option if you, uh, if there's no way to do it with this. Uh, anyway, we have to create an endpoint now and hook that up with the data. So uh, an endpoint in, in with retrofit is uh, implemented through an interface. Um, so this is where let's go back to room for a little bit. So in room, you create data access objects as interfaces, and then you write at query, and this is the SQL query that this function will process. Um, in a way, uh, this library retrofit uh, works similarly just with HTTP requests. So we can create a function here that's called get all countries. Uh, and we can, and we basically annotate it with the request. So this is going to be a get request. And in here we put the endpoint. So this is our endpoint. So we just paste it in. So now we, this function will query this endpoint with a get request. And what do you expect it to return? So with retrofit, you use a type called call, which comes with the library. Basically, uh, it's a, we're going to interact with this type later. Uh, it's a way to 
call this endpoint. So it sort it returns what you need to do to get call the endpoint, and then you interact with the call type to actually perform the request. So we will look at that, explain that a little bit more when we are going to use it. But you give it a return type, and it's going to be call. And what we expect to get back is a list of countries. So country is the data type we just set up. And it's a list of countries because uh, the return value is an array uh, filled with countries. So that's why we're expecting to get a list of countries back. Uh, next, uh, so this is really the core of get, uh, like the very basics of interacting with an endpoint. And uh, now let's, uh, get this to show uh, in our uh, uh, recycler view. So I already wrote a, an adapter for the recycler view. Uh, it's uh, basically the same as any other, other recycler adapter. So if you've used the recycler view by now, you should be familiar with it. If not, I'm not going to go through it today because it's not the point of the lecture. Uh, we looked at it before. So, uh, so instead, uh, I'm just going to uncomment it so that we can look at it. Um, also, in our in our XML, uh, we are going to uh, enable data binding for the recycler view so that we can. So we're going to create a variable on the XML that I'm going to call country, and the type of it is uh, co the country type that we just created. That way, we can specify the text, the text of the text field uh, with the data here. So this is what we've done earlier. So now we can specify that. Did I forget? Yeah. Now we can specify that the text of the text field should be country dot country name, um, and then we get Norway, for example. And we can do that with the data binding, so we don't have to set these text fields manually. So if you don't remember this, you can go back on YouTube and look at the data binding and view binding lecture. And same here, we can have this. So this is the country code. Uh, and finally, we have the, uh, the, this, the number of extinct species. We're going to show that on the right. So now we have Norway, NO, and zero. Uh, and now we can use that directly in our Recycler view adapter. So when we, now we, when we bind the view holder, we only have to set the data binding variable country, and then the XML data binding will take care of filling out the elements in the recycler view for us. So uh, on bind view holder becomes extremely simple, and you can almost just copy paste this view holder for any type of view holder you ever need, and just change the data binding variable that you need to show and. Uh, recycler view is generally just become a matter of adding this boilerplate for the sake of having it. Anyway, uh, now we have a template to show in the XML. And in our fragment request, so this is where we have the recycler view. And now we need to just tell the recycler view that we want to use this adapter. So I haven't done that up front. Um, so we have access to our recycler view through the view binding here. So we will do view binding commit recycler. It's the only one there. And we will apply some, some things to it. So we will set the adapter to our country adapter. And we will set the, we have to instantiate it. And we have to, we set the layout manager to a linear layout manager because we want elements to be a linearly like like a linear layout basically it's going to be downwards so we just have to set that up with the recycler so it knows how to show the data that it gets um nice so now we have our country data and we have the interface and we have hooked it up with the xml so it can show in the recycler view now we just need to uh, get it in there so in the view model associated with the request, uh, we have, we're going to instantiate uh, the retrofit class. So that's uh, the major workhorse with the library. Um, and the reason we're going to do it in the view model is so if you do an HTTP request and then rotate your phone, the HTTP request is not going to be canceled. It's, it's still going to go out there. And the data in your 
on your phone is going to be valid through rotation. So this is things we've been discussing before that view models are great for uh, storing the data of your fragments or activities. So uh, to create retrofit, uh, we're going to create, make it private here, and we're going to call it retrofit. And it's instantiated through a builder. So we have to start with re retrofit. And from there, we are going to have to use a builder to create. So it has a builder variable or a builder class, which we can use to build an instance of retrofit. Uh, and to this, we can add a couple of things to it. Uh, most of all, we want to create use a base URL. Uh, and a base URL is, uh, so we, in the API here, we only specify the endpoint, like conservation slash via one slash country slash all. Uh, the base URL is what we put in front of that. So that's basically the IP address or the API URL. So for example, api.reddit.com or api.discord, if that's .com or something. Uh, in our case, we are at 127.0.0.1.8080. Uh, so if we paste that in, it's not going to be correct. Uh, and I'll, but I'll leave it like this so you can, we can show you why it's not correct. Uh, if you understand why this is not correct, uh, please type it in the chat because uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and after that, in order to be able to automatically convert from the JSON to our data type, uh, we need something called a converter factory. And that's the other library we added. So that's the converter JSON. Uh, this is the one that's able to convert the JSON we get back from uh, the API into this uh, data, uh, data class. And that's just a JSON converter factory. And we just create that. And finally, we build it. So that's what we need to get an instance of retrofit. Uh, base URL, converter factory, and build. So you can do other things here. You can set the client as well. Uh, client, and these, as you can see, it takes an OK HTTP client. So if you want to specify your own clients, you can also do that. And there, in the client, you can specify things like uh, timeouts. Uh, so if time, base timeout is too short, you can specify your own HTTP client with a higher timeout, for example. So if you want, you can override that, but if not, there's going to be a default one coming with it. So uh, once we have retrofit and the interface and the data class, we are now ready to uh, do our request and get the data back to the application. And for this, we are going to use uh, live data. Now, Retrofits, as far as I understood, does not support um, using returning live data from here. Uh, however, uh, with the recent version of Android Studio, uh, and one of the approaches that I showed you a couple of weeks ago with live data, we can give retrofit live data support uh, surprisingly easily. And we can also not have to worry about threading and callbacks because we can use coroutines with it. And um, so, yeah, let's look at how we can actually get the data out of the API environment. So I'm going to create a function called get all countries. And this function is going to be equal to live data. So if you remember this version of live data where we could emit values, um, this, fun this, uh, uh, this way of creating live data is also really great for wrapping, for example, this library now that doesn't support it uh, natively uh, because we can emit the data that this guy gets back um, and sort of create the live data from that. Uh, so I, I, that will be easier to show uh, in the code. Uh, so let's uh, do that instead. So we have our retrofit class here. And uh, from that, we need to get an instance of uh, this service, which is the country endpoint. So let's just create our service here. And that's going to be through this variable. We are going to create. And that's a service class, basically. So. We have to create what kind of interface are we going to use now? 
uh, and the interface we're going to use uh, is the country endpoint class.java. So this basically creates an instance that is able to uh, interact with this HTTP interface and we get that back. So if you want to see the type of this, we can just highlight it, hit control shift P, and then we see we get an instance of country ed endpoints. So basically it takes this interface uh, with the annotation processing and has sort of created a class that is able to do, do this get request. Uh, so once we have the service, as we can see, now we're going to interact with this call. So get all countries, uh, uh, it returns a call. So let's get access to this call uh, with service. And here's the get all countries. So if we added more functions, they would all show up here. And now this variable here, control shift P to see the type of this expression. That's call list of countries. So through a call, we have a couple of things we can do. We can enqueue, which mean, which puts it into a, uh, which basically gives you a callback uh, that you have to deal with. And that callback uh, has a success and a failure condition. And in that callback, you can process the data. But since this live data block automatically creates a coroutine context, that everything in here is a coroutine. So using a callback inside of a coroutine makes no sense since we have the power of coroutines at our fingertips. So instead of doing a asynchronous call with NQ, we can execute this call directly. Since we're already in a coroutine, uh, we don't mind to, to call a blocking function. So execute blocks until the request is done. So, and, but we don't mind that because uh, we, can choose, we can just choose not to be on the main thread if you want to. So let's do that. So we, can, we will get the response from this. And since network requests should not be run on the main thread, coroutines can still be on the main thread and it, by default it is. So we have to use with context, if you remember, uh, and say that we want to use dispatchers.io as our context. This is the network and IO context. And with that one, we want to call executes. So now it's going to go and do execute on a separate thread. And once it's done, it's going to put it in this value. We don't have to deal with the callbacks or anything else. We just get the response back as soon as it's done. If you rotate the phone, it just keeps running and you get the data when it's done. Uh, and that's really all we need to do. Once we're done, we can just admit the response and that's where we do the live data. So we, we just get the response and this line of code will not execute on this until this uh, asynchronous call has finished. Like, uh, that's what we've been discussing with core routines before. And then we just emit the response once we're done, which uh, if anyone subscribes to this, they will get the list of countries. But we actually don't want to emit the response itself. Uh, we want to emit the body because the body is a list of countries. So let's just emit. Uh, we want to emit the list of countries and not the response. So now we see that this one is now a live data of list of countries. And that's really all the lines we need to do this call. And now we only need to go back to our fragment and subscribe to this live data. So let's go view model, get all countries that observe with our view lifecycle owner. And then we have our observer. It gets a list of country. So we want to go only the list of countries is not, is not null. Then we want to go through our uh, recycler view and set the list. So, so we have to go through the adapter because that's where the list is. And we know that this is a country adapter. And through that one, we can go submit list and pass it the countries list. Um, so this is uh, basically a little bit of repetition from live data, how you subscribe to it. We pass a lifecycle owner, which means uh, this is, it's only going to be observed as long as this lifecycle is uh, active. And it and question mark dot let, uh, dot let basically means if, so, so the question mark is as normal, uh, only if it's not null, call dot let. And 
that means in this case, this block of code will only be executed if this is not null. And we get the list of countries here as a non-null, nullable list of countries. This is guaranteed to be non-null if you get to this place. So you need no longer have to check for null in here. Um, and that should be what we need to do. So let's be hopeful and try to compile it. So if we go here now, yeah, so we do crash actually, connection refused, yeah. And that's because of the error that uh, I left in there on purpose. Nobody typed why it's a mistake. Um, so this is the error, failed to connect to 127001. Okay, let's try to connect to it here. Oh, it still works, it works fine. Um, why doesn't it work from the emulator? Why does 127001 not work when we try to connect it from here? I hope someone's going to be brave enough to go come to the chat and type it out. Well, or if not, that's fine. Um, because uh, the reason for this is 127001 works fine in this browser because 127001 is the loopback address. It means my computer or, or this device. And in this case, that's my machine where I'm hosting uh, the servers. This is, uh, yeah, where it is, there is it. The server is starting on port 80 on my computer. Uh, but the emulator is not my computer. It has its own IP address and it is not hosting our Go server. So you cannot test it with 127001. Uh, thankfully on Android, uh, your machine is always going to be 10.0.2.2. Uh, uh, that's uh, just a built-in mapping to your machine. So if you need to connect to something you have on localhost, uh, 10022, is your machine that's running the emulator. Or if you were interacting with google.com, of course you don't have to worry about this because Google is, uh, is accessible from anywhere. You don't, you don't have to change this. But since I'm hosting the Go API on my machine now, I have to also update, update the IP address to become my machine and not the emulator itself. So now if I go to HTTP, look at that. There's all our list of countries with all of the species. And it updates automatically as soon as it's done because we have the risk request set up with uh, set with live data. So as soon as we update, now everything is out of order. Uh, and that's because the API doesn't sort it or anything up front. So we just get everything in a raw list. And right now, if we go to the top, we can see Azerbaijan is at the top. If I go back and forth, now Mar Mauritius is on the top. And now Liechtenstein is on the top because it's a random order. Uh, but now we can use some of the techniques from uh, previous uh, live data things like transformations if we want to sort this or something. Uh, we can also cache the data we get by putting it into a room database. So for example, we could also turn country into a room entity and then we'd be, the, we'd be able to take the data we get from HTTP because now every time I go here, it does the request all over again. We could cache this data in room and then check, hey, is the cache, how long ago is it since each of these elements were put in there? And only refresh the data through retrofit if it was too old or if we maybe drag it down to get the refresh. Um, so, uh, but uh, before, but instead of looking at that right now, those are just opportunities. We're going to look a little bit more at uh, retrofit since that's the point of this lecture. So this is the very basic example. We have one URL and it's pretty much a static URL. Uh, however, however, I did mention that we can get a specific country like Norway, USA, uh, it's probably US, but anyway. Um, and we don't want to create uh, get, for example, USA info. That's really not going to cut it since that would be very tedious. So. 
Uh, retrofit supports variables in here, so you can, so if you put curly braces and type, for example, country or CNT, I don't know, yeah, CNT, whatever. Uh, we can now use this as a variable to interact with the API. So for example, we can get a country, get country instead of get all countries. Uh, and here we go, here we have to create a variable called CNT and it's a string. So basically this variable is a string, but we also have to tell retrofit about this and that's where we use at path and we say CNT. So we, you could call this one country, but CNT has to match with this guy. So basically whatever we put into country is going to be mapped to this one, but we might as well call it the same thing since, uh, since that's what we're expecting. So if we do this query, it will replace what you pass to the string in here. So let's just create in our view model, let's create uh, uh, one more here. Let's call that we, let's just re change this one right away actually, to just use get country instead. And let's pass NO instead. And this one does not return a list of countries anymore. If we go here and just go slash NO, we will see that it's not an, a list anymore. It's just a single object. So uh, this one actually just returns a single country. So we have to update that. Uh, and if we go to our fragment again, this is no longer a list, so I'll just make it a list. So the recycler view can use it. So it's just a list of that single element. And if we run the code now, we should only see Norway in here. Yeah, so now we only have Norway. Um, so it would of course be nice to have a text field in, in maybe have an edit text in here where we could type the text and it would do the query based on that. And you can totally do that. I just not gonna do it now because we're running a little bit short on time. Um, but you can see obviously this should be a parameter instead of uh, hard coded. But the idea here is that you can put variables into the, into the API string and pass them in here. Uh, the next thing is if we have Norway, we currently have 19 species on Norway. Uh, but from cloud, we were able to specify a limit on this, for example, uh, 20. Well, that's a default, so or about 200. Yeah, so now we get a lot more. So now we have suddenly 107 things, or we can specify two, and we get just two species. So how do we add query parameters to the end of this? Um, it's uh, quite simple. Uh, we can add a variable limit, which is an integer. And we just have to prefix it with a query. Now this is the same as it's in room, so make sure you choose the right one. <laughs> and it's going to be limit. So if you do this, retrofit will append this to this append this to this value and go basically limit equals uh, what you type in here. Um, so that's what how you add extra query things. So limit. Let's try it out. And the only thing we have to change is in the view model. Now we have Norway, so let's also pass 200 here. And let's just run the code. So now you saw it was 20 species. And if we go there now, you can see, oh, there's 108 species now because the limit was high enough for it to be able to capture all of them. Um, or we can change the limit to two. And now we should only get two species in here. So uh, that's how you would add query parameters. Uh, and the, if we, now we don't have a post request here to try out with, but basically you can also use post and this can be the same. Let's ass if, uh, assuming we could, we're allowed to put the post thing here, we could, for example, submit new user, and then we would go at body. And then we can use a data class again, for example, country, and then it will JSONify this one and send that in the body, for example, country, country. Oh, actually, I guess submit new country makes more sense. 
And that's how you would submit a post request where the body is of type country. So if you had a special type of body, you would create a data class with the required data format and just pass that as a body and it would be a post request. And this one technically, if it's supposed to also return something, you can add the return here as well. So those are some of the main things that you're going to need, uh, probably all of the basics. So path variables, query parameters, and sending a body with a post request. That's going to get you a really uh, long way. Uh, now let's uh, look at those questions. So what we're not using here, we're not using the species key, and we're not using the uh, country flag. We're only using the code, code name and species. So let's see what happens if we get rid of those guys. Uh, and we go to our endpoint or the view model and get this guy back to get all countries. This is a little bit more interesting. And then in the fragment also get this guy back in there because now it's a list again. So let's see what happens if you don't include the fields you're not interested in. Yeah, it works uh, just fine. So that's uh, expected even. So if you're only interested in a couple of fields of the JSON, you don't have to in include the ones you don't care about and you get still get the data just, just fine. So nice, that's basically the introduction to retrofit. If you have any questions, you can ask them now. If not, I'm going to uh, just uh, show you some, uh, build a little bit on top of this to like maybe filter or sort this stuff. But we looked at that before. So if you're interested in a recap on that, I can do it. Uh, if not, I encourage you to go, maybe try to interact with uh, your Go assignment. Maybe do the second assignment instead and try to get the list of commits from GitLab in here. Uh, try to interact with your own API because uh, now that we've consumed this API we created in Go last semester from this, this phone, you can see that since all of this processing and combination of APIs is now done on, uh, on our Go backend, the phone doesn't have to do much work. It just has to get the data from the API. So since the server or the backend here is doing most of the work and the phone is just getting the results, you can think of the phone here as a very thin client. It doesn't do much work. And this is something you discussed in software engineering as well. And since the server is now looking up in the other API and aggregating the data from the EU countries and the GBIF, uh, it's doing all the data aggregation and combination and lookup. So the server or the backend here is doing most of the work. So that's a thick client now. If you instead did all of that work, like uh, gathering data from EU countries and connecting with the species, figure out you know, all the endangered stuff. If you did that on this phone, it would use more battery, more network. So you would do more work on your clients. So you'd have a thicker client. So, um, And now if you're designing apps or in the future when you will doing this, uh, you, you now have a little bit more of an understanding. You've created both the backend servers with the REST APIs. And now you're creating phones that can consume these APIs and show them in a more user-friendly way with all of the data. Uh, you can think about what does your app need? Do you need a thicker client, a thinner client? Should you do the work on the back end? Is it easier to do it in Golang than with Kotlin? Because sometimes it's easier to do the data processing with Golang or some other back end that you use like JavaScript, uh, Node.js. Um, you can maybe write a C server, C++, and just interact with it there. For example, if there's a library that is really good in Go, to process some data, maybe use that instead and just provide the data to an application. Like, so these are things you can now start to think about because you've been able to consume and use the API on both ends. Or for example, as I mentioned, you can cache this data in rooms so it, you don't have to do a network request every time you open the fragment. So that, that way you could see the data even if you're offline. Um, so these are things to consider for sure. Um, now we have nine more minutes. Um, I don't know if I'm going to keep you here, but uh, uh, if you would like, we could add the sorting or the filtering again, if you need a recap. Um, if nobody says anything, I'm just going to stop here. So type in chat if you would want to have 
a little bit more examples on this. If not, I'm going to just upload the video and the uh, code from, from this project to GitLab. And thank you for showing up and hope that you learned something regarding use, the use of retrofit and using uh, HTTP requests with Android and how to combine it in a nice way with what we learned earlier with live data coroutines. Like this is really clean compared to using the, for example, if we had to use, I'm gonna show the alternative here, if we didn't have access to coroutines, we would have to go through the call and go in queue. And then we have to create an object of type callback. And what we were expecting to get back here is something like response of a list of country. And then we needed to, I don't even know if this is what we would be expecting to get here. Yeah, it is. And then you, we have to implement both of those. Why didn't they show up? Oh, I'm expecting one more. And then it's complaining that, yeah, I see. Yeah, there we go. Then we can implement those guys. And then we in on failure, we would have to do some things. And then in on response, we would have to do some other things. Like, so in response, we would basically have to deal with the response object here. But this is called asynchronously on the, on another, on the main thread. And it's like, you, you see how much this gets quickly, this can get, become a mess. Instead of just having one line where we just execute then it, as soon as, and it's not going to get to the next line until it's done. And all of your other code is just gonna keep running as usual since it's elegantly, just uh, delegated to a to the IO dispatcher, and here we can still check for errors. We can go like response dot is successful. We can just look at the headers, the raw error body if there is anything. It's four lines, whereas instead of having this in queue call and on its own be like seven, eight, nine, ten lines. So, but yeah. Um, there is nobody requesting any more examples, so I'm going to assume that you'll be able to figure this out by yourself, or you can ask, send me questions on Discord more or less any time, and I'll answer when I have time. Um, yeah, so thank you for showing up. I uh, hope you found it interesting. Uh, I'll post the code, and if you want to have a challenge, try to adapt this or use this uh, with your second Go assignment, or maybe you've written some other REST API maybe your project uh, or maybe some other online API if you're using that. So yeah, I hope also, I hope all of you are doing well in the quarantine days, staying healthy, going outside for walks or, you know, whatever you do in quarantine these days. So uh, yeah, have a good day, have a good week and I will see you later.